sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk, and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G. I. Gurdjieff and P. D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening. Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm your host, Kay Smith. Today's show will investigate the chemistry of the work of Gurdjieff and Ospensky. The work teaches us that there are many obstacles to awakening in our life. However, they are not insurmountable. Gurdjieff said people are dropped into the sea of life to see whether they swim or drown. Using the practical approach of verification and understanding, Through growth of knowledge and being, we can learn to swim through our lives. From a psychological point of view, man can be divided into seven levels of being. The first three levels represent mechanical man, ordinary man as we find him. Everyone is born as either man number one, two, or three. In mechanical man, one of the functions mechanically predominates over the other functions, causing the man or woman to see the world from the unbalanced point of view of the predominant function. Man number one is known as instinctive moving man. In him, the instinctive and moving functions predominate over the emotional and intellectual functions. Man number two is known as emotional man. In him, the emotional function mechanically predominates over the other functions. Man number three is known as intellectual man wherein the intellectual function mechanically predominates over the instinctive, moving, and emotional functions. Man number four is not born as such. He is a product of school culture. His centers or functions are more balanced, and he has developed a permanent center of gravity. That is, the ideas of his personal self-development have become more important than his other interests. Man number five is a man whose functions are balanced and has acquired unity and self-consciousness. He is different from ordinary man because in him, one of the higher centers already works, the higher emotional center, and he has many functions and powers that man one, two, and three do not possess. Man number six is a man who has acquired objective consciousness. Both the higher emotional and higher intellectual centers are at work. He possesses many more new faculties and powers beyond the understanding of an ordinary man. Man number six differs from man number seven only by the fact that some of his properties have not as yet become permanent. Man number seven is a man who has attained all that a man can attain. He has permanent eye and free will. He can control each of his states of consciousness and cannot lose anything that he has acquired. From one point of view, he is considered immortal within the limits of the solar system. So as we are, we are each man number one, two, or three, maneuvering through our lives in mechanical states that keep us asleep to our real selves. We think that we are what we are. We are instead, as Gurdjieff says, we are what we have become. So some of the first steps are to study the mechanical states that operate in us and learn how to come out from under them. The first of these mechanical states that we will look at today is the state of imagination. We have many imaginary things we must throw off before we come to real things. So as long as we live in imaginary things, we cannot see the value of the real. And only when we come to real things in ourselves can we see what is real outside us. Note that we are not talking about directed imagination. 
When someone wishes to construct something, they use their directed imagination to picture their idea or concept. This process builds and goes on until one decides a course of action to be taken. In such a case, the imagination is the servant of the mind. We call this planning, not imagining, because the idea of planning comes first and the imagination second. The object is not to produce an imaginary situation, but a real one. In the daydreaming and negative imagination we are going to discuss, it is the other way around. An imaginary situation is the aim, and the mind is used to assist in its creation because in daydreaming, there is a certain amount of direction according to the form which it takes, but the direction is effortless relative to planning. Imagination is one of the principal sources of the wrong work of centers. Each center has its own form of imagination and daydreaming, but as a rule, both the emotional and moving centers make use of the intellectual center because daydreaming corresponds to its own inclinations. Daydreaming is the absolute opposite of useful mental activity. When we speak of useful intellectual work, we mean a mental activity that is directed toward a definite aim and undertaken for the sake of obtaining a definite result. Daydreaming does not have any purpose. It does not have any aim. The motive for daydreaming is always in the emotional or moving functions. Most often, we see it come up as an avoidance tactic for the intellect. The intellect is being lazy and does not want to make an effort in a particular direction. Instead, it will tend to gravitate toward thinking about what could have been, or should have been, or might have been in any given situation. Many people even choose to spend their time in unpleasant daydreaming, imagining the worst possible scenario for any given event. One scary fact about imagination is that since it is in each function, it can satisfy each function and therefore go on indefinitely. You may know people who seem to spend their entire lives in imagination, swinging from positive to negative imagination. We tend to imagine non-existent capacities in ourselves, wishing if only we had more time. We imagine that we can easily go up against any mechanicalness if we wanted to. Ironically, we also often imagine that we can do less than we are actually capable of doing. It has many costumes by which it can be recognized, carries a grudge, and likes to strengthen, expand, and embroider upon all the wrongdoings that have been done to it. It loves to go into self-pity, beginning with the expression, if only. Think about the last time you went out with friends for drinks. It does not take long for the if-onlys to start. If only I married a different person. If only I made more money. If only I lived somewhere else. In imagination, we believe that things could be different from what they actually are. This state constantly imagines unpleasant events will happen. Thus, fear, anxiety, and many other negative emotions can run amok freely. It imagines one's own inadequacies, as well as imagining and distorting past events. There are always many causes for our negative imagination. First, you have to observe that you are in it. Then you can, if you try, to stop it and replace the imaginary thought with a constructive idea. Turn to the next thing. Give your attention to something. The minute you turn your attention on imagination, it stops, for it can only work in the dark. In this way, you are seeing the chemistry of the work at work. The next state we are going to discuss is the state of identification. Identification occurs when our energy and attention is fixed on one aspect of a thing. It is one centered work, a form of hypnosis, and should be distinguished from concentration and attention, which are useful and necessary. It can be emotional or intellectual. It produces mechanical reactions that keep on, keep on acting in the same way. These habits become so fixed that one no longer notices the emotion. Ospensky said all identified people cease to be human. Of themselves and their existence, nothing remains at all. For the time being, they have entirely disappeared. Gurdjieff called identifying the greatest enemy we have to overcome. It is through always being identified that we are kept asleep. 
The difficulty is that we naturally become more easily identified with the things that interest us most. It is difficult to observe. People think it is a good trait and call it passion, enthusiasm, zeal, or inspiration, and so on. Most people believe that only by identifying can a man do good work. In reality, this is an illusion. Actually, identification means loss. We cannot do anything sensible when we are in this state. It is one of our most elusive foes, and it can enter anything. We can be under its influence every waking moment. If we believe we do not identify, we are identified with the idea that we are not identified. Identification and consciousness are incompatible. People in the work eventually run into this difficulty. They have some favorite identification. They do not want to give up. And at the same time, they want to be conscious. However, it cannot be done. Esoterically, the new man referred to in the scriptures is a man rich in identifications. Poor in spirit refers to one who is not identified. Man is always in a state of identification. Only the object of identification changes. We should first of all study what it means to oneself in all its forms. After self-observation, the second step is to struggle against it, and this is done through self-remembering. From one point of view, the struggle is not so difficult because if we can see it, it becomes so ridiculous that we cannot remain identified. Laughter may be useful in this respect if we can turn it on ourselves. Everything in life is a means, not an end. That is, all circumstances, all events can be taken as a means for not identifying. Learn to take things impartially, not personally. Every act of not being identified saves energy and insulates you from the effects of life. To remember oneself has to take the place of identifying. By non-identifying, we make possible another psychology, a second body, a new man or new woman. Inner considering is another mechanical state that we move about our world with. This is a special form of identification that focuses on oneself and others. In the state of inner considering, we are constantly identified with what others are thinking about us, what they are saying or emoting to us. We are offended by what they say, how they say it. We are identified with the way they treat us and what we are owed. We, when inner considering, we believe we are not valued or respected as much as we deserve to be. It always takes the form of some sort of inner bargaining, of thinking that other people do not consider us enough. There are so many subtle forms of it, we do not even notice it, and yet our life is filled with it. You must try in free moments to have a right mind about it. When you are considering, it is too late. You must think of typical cases of inner considering, of what produces it, and then have a right point of view about it and realize how useless and ridiculous it is. It is important to remember that this work is psychological. Do not imagine that it is quite easy. The work means work, hard work on yourself. Remember that this work is, is for those who really wish to work and change themselves. It is not for those who wish to change the world. No one can work on himself without observing what this work tells him to observe in himself and seeing what it is that he or she has to work on. You must be able to perceive your inner state at any particular time as distinct from your outer physical body and what it is doing. Once people can distinguish between their physical appearance and their inner states, they can begin to work. They see that they have a body which obeys orders and a psychology. There's a special aspect of a person based on inner considering that is referred to in the work as singing your song. This is psychological, not physical singing. It is based on making inner accounts that is feeling what you were owed and recording it in memory. Everyone has a song to sing in this respect. If you truly want to know what kinds of inner accounts you have made throughout your life, 
begin to notice the typical songs that you sing. Sometimes people sing their songs without any encouragement, and sometimes after a few glasses of wine, they begin to sing openly. They sing about how badly they have been treated, about how they never had a real chance, about their past glories, about how no one understood their difficulties, about how nice they really are, and so on. And all this means how everyone is to blame except themselves. All this is making inner accounts, or rather, it is the result of making accounts. Why do you think it might be necessary in the work to be rid of these songs? Well, they take our energy and cripple us inside. You smile bravely. You all know that brave smile. And it's all lies. Good singers cannot make it in the work. As soon as anything difficult comes their way, they start singing and get stuck. Trapped by these sad songs, one cannot get beyond what one is. It is a sign of being. Being is what you are. And to change being, one must be what one must not be what one is. A good singer does not understand himself. They prefer to sing the song that they are so misunderstood and so dream of a marvelous world in which everything is arranged so that they are a central figure in it. This attitude and these dreams create a weakness and, in fact, a real psychological sickness for a man which, for which a man may have to pay throughout their whole life. When we reach this state, we have, as it were, let life overcome us. This applies to people who both make no effort as well as those who make ordinary efforts. The commonality is that they feel that life owes them things that they have never attained. They feel they should be happier and very often think that other people seem to be happier and better off than they are. So these secret songs stand in the way of our inner development. Only deep self-observation will reveal them. And all self-observation is to let light in to oneself. That is the light of consciousness. In this way, the chemistry of the work can begin to transform us. Now there are two kinds of considering, internal and external. Internal considering we've talked about, it's the same as identifying. External considering needs a certain amount of self-remembering. It means taking, to, taking into account other people's weaknesses, putting oneself in their place. Often in life it is described by the word tact. Only tact may be educated or accidental. External considering means control. If we learn to use it consciously, it will give us a possibility of control. In our last show, we spoke about the nine influences that are constantly at play on us. These mechanical states that we are speaking about today are also constantly influencing us psychologically, albeit mechanically. When we go into an interaction with another person, we learn to listen to hear different voices. With practice and increased understanding, you can even learn to hear when another person is lying to you. Perhaps you are familiar with the expression, say what you mean and mean what you say. While it is an excellent saying, it is quite difficult to carry out. In any given conversation between two people, there are actually four voices going on. The first voice is the words that we speak out loud, mechanically coming from our chief feature. The second voice is what we mean that is not spoken. This one mechanically comes from a fixed buffer. The third voice is what the other person is saying out loud to you, mechanically coming from their chief feature. And the fourth voice is what the other person is emoting and not saying. And that one's mechanically coming from their fixed buffer. While this line of work is a more advanced one, it is important because we can have an interaction with another in the standard mechanical way in which both people are in their false personalities, lying and not actually communicating. Or we can have it in a more real way in which both parties are attempting to self-remember and create an ascending octave. 
In addition to listening to different voices, we also learn to see through the masks that we each wear. People wear one or another kind of mask and believe that they are exactly like this mask, when in reality they are quite different. Each of us has several masks, not just one. You can observe your own masks and other people's masks. Try to realize that in different circumstances, you have different masks. And notice how you change them, how you prepare them. Everybody has masks, but you have to see your own. We begin to acquire masks at an early age, even as young school children, when we wore one mask with one teacher and another mask with a different teacher. It can be based on a, a kind of self-protection, and sometimes it has to do with imitation. You can at times see 50 or even hundreds of people wearing the same mask. What happens when you take off the mask? You might find another mask, or even worse, you might find that you cannot take it off. The mask has grown to the face. However, when you start to work on yourself, you find that masks are no longer necessary and that without them, life becomes much easier. There is a lot less lying going on. You have to remember that this work is based on self-knowledge. We want to know ourselves. When we find something in ourselves that we do not know, we have to study it. We think we know ourselves and now we find that all we know is masks and that masks change. We have to study each of these areas that we are discussing, not simply the theory of them. The work is practical. Each thing we discuss is applied to yourself, observed, verified, and later with special exercises worked against intentionally and consciously for your own knowledge, growth of being, and eventually understanding. Maternal conditioning plays a large part in the formation of these masks, as well as many other mechanical tendencies. In our formative years, our parents, mostly our mothers, taught us the ways of the world, manners, how to respond politely in social situations, and in general, how to act in an appropriate manner. This is not to say that any of this upbringing was bad or undesirable. You have to think psychologically and imagine how to bring intentionality and consciousness to your actions. The maternal conditioning is a strong mechanical influence on us even as adults. Go through your day and observe how many times you did not do something some of your eyes may have wanted to do because it was not the right or correct thing to do. With maternal conditioning, we have to struggle with that which we do mechanically because with the influence of the conditioning, we don't have a chance to do them, to do those things intentionally, to do them in a more conscious way and make them our own. It is not so much choosing between right and wrong, rather choosing between two rights. The trick is to attempt to work against the mechanicality of the influence, not simply react in sleep. Well, I've given you some things to think about and I wanted to end today's show with a couple of thoughts from Epictetus's The Art of Living. To have a life of virtue, you have to become consistent, even when it isn't convenient, comfortable, or easy. It is incumbent that your thoughts, words, and deeds match up. This is a higher standard than that held by the mob. Most people want to be good and try somewhat to be good, but then a moral challenge presents itself and lassitude sets in. When your thoughts, words, and deeds form a seamless fabric, you streamline your efforts and thus eliminate worry and dread. In this way, it is easier to seek goodness than to conduct yourself in a haphazard fashion or according to the feelings of the moment. When you free yourself of the distractions of shallow or illusory pleasures and devote yourself instead to rightful duties, you can relax. When you know you've done the best that you can under the circumstances, you can have a light heart. Your mind doesn't have to moonlight, making excuses, thinking up alibis, defending your honor, 
feeling guilty or remorseful. You can simply cleanly move on to the next thing. It is so simple, really. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you start something, finish it. Virtue is our aim and purpose. The virtue that leads to enduring happiness is not a quid pro quo goodness. I'll be good in order to get something. Goodness in and of itself is the practice and the reward. Goodness isn't ostentatious piety or showy good manners. It's a lifelong series of subtle readjustments of our character. We fine-tune our thoughts, words, and deeds in a progressively wholesome direction. The virtue inheres in our intentions and our deeds, not in the results. Why should we bother being good? Try to be good is to be happy, to be tranquil, tranquil and worry-free. When you actively engage in gradually refining yourself, you retreat from your lazy ways of covering yourself or making excuses. Instead of feeling a persistent current of low-level shame, you move forward by using the creative possibilities of this moment, your current situation. You begin to fully inhabit this moment instead of seeking escape or wishing that what is going on were otherwise. You move through your life by being thoroughly in it. The virtuous life holds these as treasures, your own right action, your fidelity, honor, and decency. Virtue is not a matter of degree, but an absolute. Thank you for joining us today. Remember to visit our website to watch all of the videos that we have created. That is wisdomthroughaction.org, as well as on Facebook. There is a video on the formatory apparatus that is another mechanicality that hangs over our heads that is connected with today's show that will be on our website. Be sure to contact me when you are ready to start your journey on inner development. Remember, you can reach me at kkay321 at verizon.net. We have classes online as well as face-to-face classes. So I hope to see you soon. Otherwise, I'll see you next time here on Wisdom Through Action.